Welcome to Soccer 101, the podcast where we explain the beautiful game and its accoutrement. On today's show, we're looking at the most important aspect of soccer, the thing that no soccer game can take place without corporate sponsorship. Just kidding, we're talking about the ball today. We're going to be finding out how that spherical object became part of the game, what they've been made of through the years, some of the best and the worst ones out there, all kinds of fun stories about balls. Joining me today, my name's Ryan Bailey, by the way. We have a man who is more than used to talking a load of old balls. It's Graham Rudman. <laughs> that is certainly me, and I knew you would get a balls joke in there pretty quickly, Ryan, and you did not let me down. Here comes another one. Also, here is a man who loves playing with balls, possibly. I don't know. Joe Lowry? Goodness, I should stop. That was such <laughs> low-hanging fruit, Ryan. Like, I mean, come on. I know you can do better than that, but also, again, not surprised because this is just the perfect opportunity for this stuff. Can I do better than that, Joe? Can I? I don't know about that. I don't that. know. <laughs> I guess I don't know either, Ryan. <laughs> Yeah, the temptation was too strong. I apologise, but um, we're talking about soccer balls in particular here. I'd like to start off to cleanse our palates, gents, and talk about the first ball that you owned as a child. I'll kick off. Um, during Italia 90, which was the 1990 World Cup, um, I, believe, I believe it was McDonald's. If you went a certain amount of time, so you got some coupons or something, you got this Coca-Cola mini skills ball and it was sort of had red panels and white panels and it had the little Italian anti mascot and everyone I knew had one of those. I was like five or six years old, however old I was back in 1990. And it was like the thing that everybody had and everyone was very excited about in the playground. That is my first memory of a soccer ball. It was a tiny little one that you could use indoors and break loads of your parents' precious furnitures and whatnot. <laughs> Graham, did you have anything like that? The, the the ball that I remember having as a kid, like as a young kid, was the one that you mentioned to me off air I think, uh, yesterday, I think it was, Ryan, when we were talking about doing this 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 podcast, was the... The flyaways, as I used to call it, it was a. Uh, you, you jogged my memory of what the brand was. It was a shoot size mm-hmm. five, and this um, this this ball just has absolutely no weight at all. It doesn't go where you want it to go. Um, a little bit like the 2010 World Cup uh, Jabalani ball, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's the first ball that I remember having as as a young kid, and then. Kind of skipping ahead here to uh, what our, we'll talk about our favourite soccer balls later in the podcast, podcast. but the first ball that I really kind of treasured as a slightly older kid was the, the ball for the 2002 World Cup, the Adidas Fever Nova, as I think it was called. It was, it was gold, it mm. felt like something from the future, it was inspired by Asian culture with the World Cup being held in South Korea and Japan, and yeah, I really, really loved that ball. So those are the two that stick in my memory to this day. The 2002 ball was definitely a classic, Graham, as was the shoot size, size five. Uh, to be clear to our American listeners, that was like the archetype playground ball. It was one that was in every single playground. Sort of just about heavier than a balloon, I'd say, Graham. Thicker yeah. thicker plastic was used <laughs> Not there. Not much heavier. <laughs> Not much heavier, but you get it in like the corner store in the newsagent and they, they will be everywhere. So those, uh, those for, for the young Brits are, are what you grew up with. Joe, what about yourself? To give you guys some context into how different my upbringing and soccer culture has been to both of yours, uh, I will answer the question, but I wanted to drop this first because we're talking about school and balls that we you know, play with at school to go out and play soccer. Um, at one point, we went off to, to do PE. I think we went to a nearby park, and we had forgotten the soccer ball, or, or somehow the soccer ball had been lost. And so our PE teacher decided to have us play soccer with an American football instead. Uh, and we did that for about an huh. hour, and I cannot imagine that that would ever happen in the United. Wait, hold Kingdom. on, hold so, on, like uh, like an like an NFL like, yes pigskin yes. ball, yes, yes. Wow, okay, it was <laughs> it was terrible, right? It didn't work. So I don't have the same affinity or, or, or like experience with a lot of these things that you guys do. But the first soccer ball I remember was really not a soccer ball at all. It was a little stuffed, you could fit it in the palm of your hand kind of soccer ball that I had as a kid. And I don't, it, it just was always there. And I do remember my family, my parents and my sister and I playing two on two at some point uh, using the front door, the ins- inside the house, using the front door as one goal and maybe the entrance into the kitchen as another goal in one of the houses we used to have. So that's kind of my earliest rem- memory of a soccer ball like thing. Um, and, and hopefully that gets to your question, Ryan. Wow, that's incredible, Joe. I was gonna I was gonna mention later in the show how 
Uh, the ball is very important to soccer, but you can technically pe- play it with anything. I remember my wife went to Tanzania uh, on a on a charity sort of school project thing a couple of years ago, and she'd say how they would ball up socks, not just like one yeah. sock, but like a whole ball of socks, and they would play with that. And I remember in a playground when we didn't have the shoot size five, the aforementioned, we'd use a, a soda can, flatten it, and that was that was what we'd use. You can use yeah. absolutely anything, but. A gridiron style ball, Joe. That's that's a whole new level. <laughs> it was not a good level either. I'd add. <laughs> <laughs> I would. I'd be inclined to agree. Well, wait till you hear what they used to hear. Uh, used to use Joe back in them old days. We're going to start off with the history of the game. The game was codified in the late nineteenth century, of course, around eighteen sixties, eighteen sixty three, I think it is. But uh, the actual act of kicking a ball uh, seems to have originated long before that. The Chinese and in the Han Dynasty in the second and third centuries, according to my notes, Graham, uh, they had a game which uh, was soccer adjacent, I think we can call it. They kicked mm-hmm. a leather ball filled with feathers and hair through a small opening. The ball apparently measuring around 13 to 14 inches, which is pretty big. And they got it into kind of a net, which was only just wide enough to fit that. Um, later in, um, in more European cultures, Graham, they also used the skulls of fallen enemies in battles and hogs' heads. Um, <laughs> Gra- Graham, you come from an uh, uncivilized country. Have you ever done that? <laughs> That's still how the old farmers played with, <laughs> with those balls. Yeah, I, I, I think I came across kind of the same research as you, Ryan, which stated that it, it suggested a lot of kind of animal uh, parts, anatomy, were used as mm. early uh, soccer balls, which is quite something, but I guess kind of makes sense in, in those times when you didn't have kind of the, the manufacturing process that you have now or even in the, the 19th or 20th centuries. Indeed. Joe, question for you. Have you ever seen a pig's bladder? Uh, I can't say I have, Ryan. Do you have a lot of experience with pig's bladders? <laughs> Not a lot, but I'm reading that in the earliest round balls, non-skull or uh, head-shaped balls, uh, pig's bladders were the uh, sort of the inside of those earliest balls. Um, uh, And we read stories of games between opposing villages where you had to kick a pig, pig's bladder between the villages and uh, and you had to kick it onto like the balcony of the opponent's church some very apocryphal tales uh, from that kind of things but the pig's bladder and I actually looked it up and found some pictures of them they're as gross as you'd expect them to look uh, but <laughs> yeah. they are round they're pretty light they're easy to inflate and in those times and indeed now they were plentiful um, and Graham I actually found out the oldest soccer ball ever found and still, still I believe in existence was was made in the 1540s in the 16th century it's a pig's bladder covered with pieces of leather possibly deer leather it was found in 1981 at sterling castle in scotland yep, yep that is correct sterling is home to the oldest football in the world i have to say i i'm not i wasn't entirely confident on what kind of ball it was and i'm a little bit surprised that it is literally uh, animal parts <laughs> i was under the impression that it was an actual ball but there you go yes i did know that 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 ball is at uh, sterling castle yeah, well, uh, in the, in the mid nineteenth century, Graham, things veered slightly more towards veganism. Um, an American, Charles Goodyear, <laughs> who um, patented vulcanized rubber, that led to the use of rubber instead of pigs' bladders in soccer balls, um, with leather panels stitched over them. Uh, the problem with a lot of these balls, though, Joe, was, um, and this is the sort of balls that were started to use into the 1900s as well, and the FA made size and regulation and um, weight regulations for these kind of balls. I believe they said they had to be between 27 and 28 inches in circumference and weigh between 13 and 15 ounces, which is, what, like a pound? I'm not sure how many ounces there are in a pound. I, I losing my mind but um joe the problem was they um they got rather full of water and become quite heavy yeah yeah i was reading some about that as well and i can imagine that would be especially challenging in the united kingdom where there is a lot of water coming down from the sky and sitting on top of the grass so not exactly air or water tight right and so it it was rubber and it was leather covering rubber bladders for a while uh, and then eventually synthetic material started to be used in the 1960s the first Mm -hmm. uh, wholly synthetic soccer ball i found at least popped up in the 1960s and then became the standard in 1980s before 
that it was leather all the way, baby. Um, but I think a big, a big part of this was the the use of synthetic materials, right? Because that allowed for more uh, a sturdier exterior. They added at times as well another layer between the inner and outer layers of the ball. And so moving the technology along as history continued and as time moved on, it then allowed the ball to uh, change less over the course of a game, which is kind of a foreign thought to me. The ball mm. changing and then changing how the game is played. I can understand the weather conditionings, the weather conditions, excuse me, affecting play, but to have the ball itself change and morph over the course of 90 minutes kind of kind of wild yeah definitely and i think yeah that 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 speaks to the technology that improved and the fact that the ball got a lot rounder in the mid 1900s i think as well when you're making a ball out of pig's bladders and leather hide and cow rump and cow shoulders and they're hand stitched and they're stitching on the side of them they're not going to roll perfectly round so when you get to uh, the ball you're referencing there in 1962 joe uh designed by eagle nielsen that's the um, the 32 panel ball. That's the the cl- when you think of a sort of stereotypical soccer ball. That's the one you're thinking of. 32 panels, uh, some black, some white. Uh, a spherical truncated icosahedron. A very simple uh, geometric term for you there, Graham. <laughs> um, which uh, which is that kind of shape. So that was 1962 when that came around, and the first that was um, when the first non leather balls came around. But what's interesting here is that FIFA actually preferred leather. Uh, they used leather balls right up until the 1986 World Cup. Uh, the first synthetics one was the uh, 86 World Cup in Mexico, the Adidas Azteca, which had a pretty cool design I think we can talk about later. And also, the Premier League used leather balls at the start. The mitre balls that they used at the start were also heavy leather, but things moved on quite a bit. And talking of moving on, why don't we take a very, very quick break, and when we get back, we'll talk about the progression of more of the balls that we recognise and that we've seen throughout the years in the beautiful game, Maybe some of the future technology, maybe some of the controversies from balls. More soon. Today's episode of Soccer 101 is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like checking in your baggage at the airport without a lock. You think your stuff's kept private, but you never know who's going through all that stuff. ExpressVPN helps you browse anonymously. When you use ExpressVPN, ISPs can't see your online activity. Your identity is anonymized, nice word, by a secure VPN server as well. Your data is also encrypted for maximum protection. It's very easy to use. You just fire up an app on your phone or a, an app on your on your laptop, click one button and you're away. And it works on all devices, your phones, your laptops, even routers as well. So everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected. And it's not just about security as well. A VPN allows you to fool your computer to think you're in another location. So for example, if you live in Italy and you want to use US streaming services like your Hulos, your HBOs, your Fubos and so on, you can use ExpressVPN to do so. That example is me. That's exactly what I do. ExpressVPN is superb for that purpose. I cannot recommend it enough. You can secure your online activity today by visiting expressvpn.com slash soccer today. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash soccer. If you do so, you'll get an extra three months three of ExpressVPN. That's expressvpn.com slash soccer for three months Thank you very much to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's show. Soccer 101, we are back. We're talking balls, everybody. Um, why don't we start um, talking about some of the more famous uh, balls from throughout history, gents? And that leads me to think about World Cup balls, which is where um, a, a lot of landmarks in ball history have happened, I think. We say. I'm saying the word ball far too much. I apologise. <laughs> but... Um, one thing that sort of <laughs> tends to happen through the ages is um, fewer and fewer panels on these balls. We mentioned the classic 32 panel design from 1962. Uh, 1970s ball, the Adidas Telstar, that very classic looking one, the first, uh, yeah. the first black and white ball that was used in a World Cup game, that was 32 um, panel as well. Uh, as was, I believe, the what I consider to be the archetype World Cup ball, the Adidas Tango as well. Um, that's the one that was used from 1978 onwards, right up, the same basic design used right up until 1998, so for about 20 years at Euros yep. and World Cups as well. Is that one of your favourites, Graham? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that the Tango is, is one of the most iconic match balls of all time. You mentioned that the Telstar there as well. It's iconic, but in a slightly different way. It's, it's a... 
you know, it's a, it's a silhouette of a soccer ball in that if you asked a child to draw a soccer ball, that is what they would draw with the kind of classic white panel, black panel, 32, um, 32 panels design. Mm-hmm. Whereas the, the Tango was sl- slightly more modern design from Adidas. And, and I was actually reading up on the Tango in my research. And apparently it's a great example of, quote, negative space design, is apparently, with its kind of curvy triangles forming a net around the ball and leaving white circles on which there was a, a you know Adidas logos and, and so on. It's just such a classic, simplistic design and kind of changed the way that brands looked at soccer balls that they could actually do something a little bit different. You know, it's not the boldest of designs, but it was certainly bolder than the the Telstar. I used to um, have a few Adidas Tango like replicas, Graham, and I always remember going to the store with my mum and saying, I, I want the Tango, mum. It's got so much negative space. Come on, can't you appreciate <laughs> the aesthetics? <laughs> I can just uh, yeah I can hear I can hear you in, in my in my mind saying that Ryan. Indeed, indeed. This is only a couple of years ago as well. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, we we went to sort of nineteen ninety eight with that kind of design or similar variations of the Tango, and then in twenty ten we had the reduction of panels from thirty two to eight panels on the Jabalani, and then in twenty fourteen the Brazuca at the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. Six panels, so we had this reduction in panels. Joe, I believe, I'm no scientist, but the logic in having fewer panels is that it makes the ball rounder and smoother, maybe lighter, maybe easier to manufacture. I mean, I think a lot of those things are are accurate here, Ryan. One of the interesting changes in soccer ball technology from kind of the 70s onward, according to my research, is them generally reducing the number of panels. It's exactly what you're talking about, Ryan. Earlier on, even before the 70s, soccer balls had been less uniform in shape. We've kind of already talked about that. And reducing the number of panels is a way to make the ball rounder and rounder. You're limiting the surfaces on the ball. Soccer balls aren't spheres, right? They're not perfect spheres. There's sides to them. They're very, very small, but there are sides there. And so you reduce the number of panels with some different uh, different technology. And how they do that is they stopped kind of stitching them together, which is the way it used to be done. And they started binding them together with heat. So they kind of just melt them together more so. And so when you do that, you can limit the number of panels, which then does have some effects on soccer balls. And we've seen that seen people complain about that at World Cups before but that for me is one of the most interesting changes in how these things have been manufactured in the late 20th century even now all the way up to today Indeed. And um, it might be worth talking about the evolution of Premier League soccer balls as well. Um, I mentioned earlier the Mitre, the Mitre Pro Max, which was the ball that started off in 1992 with the Premier League, which was made of leather panels. And they sort of changed the shape of the panels as the years went by, but it was still a heavy leather ball. And I I still remember going to um, Wimbledon training that who were in the Premier League at the time and kicking one of those balls, like the professional ones for the first time, which are really pumped up really hard and they're all leather and thinking, my foot hurts. Oh. Yeah. I remember that as well. It seemed that those leather balls, when, when they were pumped up to professional le- uh, levels, you could not kick them if you yeah. were a kid. And I remember <laughs> after the Pro Max, I think, came the Ultimax. That's it. And I, that ball just conjures up memories of... Newcastle United being good and Alan Shearer and Paolo Di Canio and you know another team that kind of reminds me of that era Ryan is a certain Wimbledon FC I think of them when I think of uh, that that ball that they kind of night it's a, it's a 90s ball isn't it it was yes. even today I, I saw that they released it in a limited run and it's mm. 90s nostalgia and they sold out very very quickly it's it's a, it's another icon, iconic match I think- ball. I think that's because Ryan bought all of them, Graham. I'm pretty sure that's why they sold out so fast. <laughs> I do have the world supply of uh, Mitre replicas. Yes, indeed I do, Joe. Um, and then we moved in 2000 to Nike sponsoring the balls in the Premier League. And if you think of that archetype Premier League ball for many people, it's probably the Nike Geo Merlin. Um, that's yeah. the one they called the roundest ball ever, which is quite a claim. <laughs> Um, but we have to talk about how balls have got rounder and rounder. That's one of the improvements in technology. And I think it's to do, they claimed it was to do with the bladder inside the ball being able to push all the way out to the seams of the, of the synthetic material outside of it. I, I'm talking rubbish, but basically it was very, very round. The, yeah, the best, the best version of the Nike Geo Merlin was the silver one that, they, that Nike used in the cage advert with Eric Cantona. And I had that ball and I loved that ball. And I would still like to have that ball. So if, if anyone knows where I can buy that, I, w- I will happily take that link because I just love that ball so much. The silver version was was the one. It was the one. What happened, Graham? Did you kick it over and a neighbor's dog got it? 
Well, what happened was, Ryan, we were playing with uh, Totti and Roberto Carlos and then the ship sank oh, um, no. and so it got lost at the bottom of the sea. Oh, yeah, that reminds me of the time I was playing with the depths of hell with Eric Cantona and he kicked a ball right through the devil's chest <laughs> when he took a penalty. Good times, good times. Um, and then we get to more modern Premier League balls, the Nike Merlin uh, of the last few years in the Premier League and the most recent one, the Nike Flight, which is covered, Joe, in these sort of indented chevrons. I don't know how else to describe them, but almost like a golf ball has divots in it. That's like yeah. the current trend, isn't it? And we've gone from having very, very smooth balls, sorry, uh, with lo- with less resistance in those World <laughs> Cup sort of balls of, of 2010 and 2014 to going back to technologies that we see in golf balls, essentially. Yeah, and I was reading some about that as well with the 2014 World Cup ball, right? The bazooka, they had reacted a bit to the 2010 ball, the Jabalani, which people were very upset about. Uh, pretty big controversy surrounding that particular ball. And so they tried to add some texture back to the ball, as far as I understand it, which then was essentially they're just trying to reverse course slightly to get it back to a way that people are more used to having the ball fly. And so giving the exterior of the soccer ball some texture, I think, is a, is a pretty strong and sound way to go about doing that. It is indeed. And while we're talking about sort of developments and future technologies, um, one thing that has come into play in recent years, and maybe we'll do more in the future, is microchips inside balls, gents. Um, The Adidas MyCoach Smart Ball is one I'm familiar with. It's one that's got sort of a chip inside it that can measure your shot power, your uh, how much curl do you put on the ball, the speed that it's traveling at. And I'm particularly um, uh, fond of this one because I, uh, I went to the 2013 Champions League final. I was very lucky to do so. And I went to a press event beforehand that Zinedine Zidane was present at. It was for this um, Adidas My Coach ball. And Zidane, uh, suited and booted, wearing like, you know, smart shoes and a, and a suit, um, was showing off this ball and it was inside this venue and I'll never forget it he puts the ball down just to like demonstrate with it and I'm like he's not going to start blasting the ball with his suit surely and he did and he gets this uh, my coach ball and like points to a, uh, an X on the wall sticks it on the X first time because of course he's in the Dean Zidane and then they show all the stats that he just produced from kicking this ball it was absolutely incredible that, that um, does seem quite cool yeah it was very cool and he's the most intimidating man in the world to share a room with but that's a whole other story <laughs> I can imagine uh, isn't, isn't a, a ball with a microchip in it just BB-8 <laughs> that, that's a Star Wars reference uh, Graham and I think we've established oh, come on Ryan I, I, I'm not I'm, in that I'm, universe I am not in the Star Wars but even I know what, who BB-8 is Joe I got a laugh proud of you Joe. Graham thanks Joe <laughs> yeah you're welcome that was good I liked it that was good What's odd is the Adidas Telstar used at the 2018 World Cup also had a microchip in it, but not for like tracking or power or any kind of technologies. Um, my understanding is it's got like NFC technology, like your phone's got in it, so you can like scan it and pull up fun Adidas stuff. It's not actually to do with the sport, which is quite odd. But um, it got me thinking. We, um, have we got any thoughts as to what the future holds for soccer balls? I was thinking my only theory of a development is the gas that's used inside them. Most of the time, I think we're using plain old oxygen inside them. But you know how there's like race cars that use nitrogen in their tires because it's, um, you know, it affects the inflation pressure and it can be beneficial for race cars. Maybe there's like a gas they put in soccer balls that makes them fly better. What do you think, Graham? Am I onto something? Do I need to patent this? Um, if you can come up with a benefit of putting a different gas in them rather than just doing it for the sake of it seems like you've maybe not got the theory of why you would do it nailed down there other than it's cool and futuristic um, yeah the theory is marketing Graham which is a lot of the reason these balls <laughs> okay, tend to enough. change in my, in my humble opinion uh, and while we're talking about um, balls uh, changing and the different kinds of balls why don't, we, why don't we talk about that because it's not just the standard size 5 FIFA f- size 5 that we're talking about here there's lots of different disciplines of soccer lots of different kinds of balls like um, have you guys ever played futsal before for example yes so the, the futsal ball Graham as you'll be aware is smaller it's heavier it's filled with foam and it's designed for a different style of play it's designed to keep it on the floor and to for skills and for passing all those things I'm not good at <laughs> yeah, I have played with futsal ball, ball before, and it's it's slightly strange, but obviously it's it's, it's designed to develop 
skills and it tends to be a, a size three that's another thing we should probably mention is that soccer balls have these regulated size mm. sizes so a standard ball one that you would get in a professional game as a size five some younger age groups will play with a, a size four i think up to the age of kind of 14 or 15 tends to be quite common now that you would play with a a size four and then you have the size three which is a a, a, fut- a futsal ball or, or a skills ball and then you also have we should probably mention a beach beach soccer ball which yeah is the complete opposite from a futsal ball and and that it is uh it has kind of a foam backing behind the the synthetic leather which makes for a, a kind of livelier ball it's a lighter ball and uh, i guess that would be because beach soccer is played in bare feet or it tends to be it's either played in bare feet or it's played in kind of thin socks so you can't really be kicking one of those uh, mitre pro maxis pumped up to the full no, and I think it's probably um, due to the surface as well. You, you know, you can have a bouncier ball on sand, which isn't very bouncy, but on a futsal True. court, on a hard court, you want something that bounces a bit less, I suppose, is the idea. The other one I was thinking of, Graham, and maybe this is peculiar to the UK and Europe, is those indoor soccer balls that you play five a side with. They, oh, yeah. they will, they're the same size five ball, but they're, they're like furry like a tennis ball. And I don't <laughs> think I've ever seen them in the US. Joe, you, do you know what I'm talking about here? I I don't, but I also haven't played indoor soccer before, so there could be okay. folks out there that do know this. So that's 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 not just me. That's quite a common phenomenon, Graham, isn't it? Those five aside oh, balls absolutely. you play inside. Oh yeah, I'm very very familiar with those big tennis balls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they are like when you. I've never really thought about it before, but they are strange, and they also kind of slide over the over the surface. If yeah. you know, they, a lot of the time they don't actually roll. They kind of you're kind of sliding it over the the indoor soccer surface. So yeah, those are weird. Yeah, they are weird, but cool at the same time. They have a bit less bounce. They're harder to uh, really thwack, if I'm going to coin a term there. Um, I think one other thing we should probably talk about, gents, before we wrap this one up is ball controversy. Um, I'll start off by something we mentioned earlier, that balls, um, uh, uh, um, leather balls and the balls that were used before, you know, uh, synthetic materials were introduced were very heavy, and they get very heavy in wet weather, particularly, and they cause an issue with headers. Um, and there was actually a, um, there have been several cases of players who played in the 60s and the 50s who've, um, in recent years and recent decades, complained that um, uh, it has affected their health. It's been linked with dementia, for example. Billy McPhail uh, was a player who played for Celtic in the 50s. He claimed in court a few years ago that his pre-senile dementia was caused by repeatedly heading sodden those old-style leather soccer balls. And that's something that's quite common, Graham. We, we, you, you tend to hear that a, a reasonable amount in the news. And I know that like the 1966 World Cup winning team in England, uh, they, they used to talk about, you know, heading those balls. You didn't want to do it too much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this this is a controversy that's still developing and one that we've really not yet got to grips with. As you mm. say, there's there's kind of campaigns um, and not just about kind of historic damage back in, back in the day, but about damage that can be done now. I mean, the the football the, the FA in England um, have introduced this 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 rule in the Premier League that limits teams to ten um, quote higher force headers a week in training. Um, quite how they enforce that, I'm not quite sure. And it's already there's been a controversy in the Premier League this season because Nuno Espirito Santo, yeah. the, the Spurs manager, has been pretty open in admitting that Spurs are not sticking to that limit. Again, how you enforce it, I have no idea. But that is linked to these studies that that um, you know dementia can come from not just heading soccer balls back in the day when they were a lot heavier, but heading the the, the modern ones an excessive number of times. There are concerns over that. Indeed, there are, yeah, as you say, an ongoing issue and one which uh, maybe will shape the next decade or so of the beautiful game, Graham, and maybe that de- uh, that affects the uh, development of future soccer balls too. Going back a bit further in the past, Joe, are you aware of the story of the 1930 World Cup final and the slight controversy they had with balls? I am, Ryan. You, you set the scene quite well. It's 1930, Argentina and Uruguay are playing in the World Cup final and they couldn't really decide whose soccer ball to use, if they wanted to use an Argentinian one or a Uruguayan one. And so what they ended up doing, because it wasn't regulated at this point in time in World Cup history, they ended up using Argentina's ball for the first half, and Argentina was up 2-1 using that ball at halftime. Then they swapped it in the second half to use Uruguay's ball, 
and uh, Uruguay came back to win the game 4-2. Uh, so there was some controversy there, some people who were not exactly thrilled about that. And later on in the 20th century, they did end up standardizing this whole thing quite a bit. But uh, I can understand being slightly peeved if I was an Argentina player at that particular World Cup, Ryan. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting to think that, that, you know, the standard of balls weren't codified at that point. So if you were in a different country, your ball was produced in a different way with different materials. Maybe it was even a different size. So yeah. um, to, to come to come together in a World Cup final and to have to use two different balls from do, two different places is quite a bizarre concept to think of these days. But that kind of thing certainly did happen. Um, the only other c- controversy I think I can call on, Graham, uh, also pertains to the World Cup, and more recently, 2010, and the good old Jabalani. Yeah, yeah, maybe the most controversial soccer ball of, of modern times, certainly. Um, this design, as we kind of mentioned already, I saw a, a pretty drastic departure from the norm in terms of the manufacture and the number of panels. And it was claimed by players, particularly goalkeepers, they, they claimed it was it was a lot lighter and, and it moved a lot more in the air. It was blamed for a number of uh, goalkeeping mistakes. I found an article in the build-up to that tournament from a, a, a scientist saying that because the ball, um, the ball was too perfect, he said, to fly straight. That's a quote. It was too perfect to fly straight. And so there was a lot of concern that this would, this would cause too many goals and that you would have... Um, high scoring games that weren't really a reflection of the quality on the pitch and then of course the 2010 World Cup actually happened and it was the dullest World Cup uh, (laughs) on record and all those concerns were pretty unfounded and goalkeeper mistakes were just goalkeeper mistakes I think. Frank Lampard's ghost goal was that that tournament as well? That was, that was at that tournament, but we're not blaming the Javelani for that. <laughs> <sighs> we're not indeed. We're not indeed. That was, a, yeah, a pretty wild time. And maybe, you know, the commentating cliche of he's almost hit that too well. Maybe that came from the Javelani being too nice, too good to be hit <laughs> perfectly. Yeah, I also found another quote from uh, a guy called Craig Johnson, who's uh, apparently a former Liverpool midfielder. I'm afraid I hadn't heard of him, but his 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 role in uh, soccer apparel as he was the inventor and the designer of the Adidas Predator yes, football boot. That's right. And a quote from him was, I assume he wasn't working for Adidas at this time, that at the time they made the Jabalani, but he said, whoever is res- responsible for this should be taken out and shot for crimes against football. Which is quite extreme, but that kind of reflected how much controversy there was around this ball in the build-up to this tournament. Yeah, I mean, that seems a bit much, if you ask me, frankly. <laughs> Just um, a bit. I mean, they still let the people who made United Passions go free, so if, if they can do that, then <laughs> why not let um, <laughs> let those guys be okay? I think um, one more thing I'll ask of you, gents, before we finish off here. Your favourite ball ever. I think for me, the idea that's Tango takes a lot of beating, because it, it is that sort of that ball I think of when I think of a soccer ball in my mind, it was the one I had many replicas of when I was a kid. And as I say, it was used from sort of 78 to 98. It had, it had probably in design terms, one of the longest runs that, um, and also a run that overlapped with my childhood as well. So that's uh, for nostalgic reasons, my favorite. Joe, do you have a favorite ball? Uh, I have a few contenders. The first one is not, it's not something that I grew up with. It's before my lifetime, but it is that Azteca ball for the Mexico World Cup in 1986. The design is so clean and it is classic at the same time. It's, it's a beautiful soccer ball. Two maybe that are, are obviously a bit more modern. I really do like the Brazuca in 2014. Played a lot with that ball. Played a lot of games with friends with that and, and the memories there and the, the nostalgia, as you're saying, Ryan. Very real for that one. And then I do also like the 2018 design for the, the World Cup in Russia, the Telstar 18. It's clean. I like the color scheme. It, it does look modern and it, it does look a bit hokey, but I don't know. I think it's cool. So I, I'm, I'm not too picky about design. I think I know just about as much about negative space as Graham does. But uh, those, those three are some of my favorites. All right. And Graham, your favorite ball. It can be um, a skull of a fallen enemy if you, if you wish. <laughs> I'm not limiting you. So I'm, I'm going to go with the Adidas finale. And I'm cheating a little bit because... This is this. There's been many iterations of this ball, but it's all this, all the one line. And if you don't know that name, the finale, it's because you might know it better as the Champions League star ball. Ah. Um, it's just so iconic in that it's the logo. It's the actual logo of the of the best club competition in soccer. And I love how every season they do dip, different interpretations of a of a really classic design. And for the final, they'll they'll always incorporate uh, incorporate design elements related to the whole city. Uh, 
and so there's just been different versions of it and I, i've pretty much loved every single version of it because it is using that classic design as as a base so i think that has to be my favorite of all time i also have to mention the adidas uh, mls balls purely because they all have don garber's signature on it <laughs> and i can't help but picture children in the in the store going through the balls going oh who's this ball go oh david beckham signature on this one messi signature on this one name who's on this one? Oh, it's don garber mls commissioner <laughs> oh, it's so want the signature of a businessman so on their ball graham i ask you <laughs> well he gets to lift the trophy his name's on the ball it's pretty much his league yeah it's pretty cool and i i'm 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 amazed that we got this far into the podcast without mentioning the adidas finale so thank you for doing that graham it is an iconic ball it does make me think if the european super league had happened would they have replaced the stars with dollar signs maybe? <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the signature of or uh, florentino perez <laughs> or the head of the yeah, whatever the head of gazprom probably would have signed it i imagine or something like that all right gentlemen i think we have just about covered the history of balls Joe, thank you very much for talking balls with me. <laughs> oh, Ryan, anytime. Graham, anytime you want a ball chat, you just let me know. I feel like the novelty of you talking about balls so often should have worn off after half an hour, but it hasn't. I'm still trying to su- suppress <laughs> laughter. Goodbye, Ryan. I've got plenty more in me. Thank you very much, guys, and thank you, listener. We'll be back soon. Bye! Bye!